Okay, good evening, good evening. I'm sorry. If you could just listen up for one second. Uh, I'm really happy to see and hear that you're so engaged in such lively discussions and in a way that you're continuing, presumably, the discussions that we've had now for, I think, approximately eight hours. Uh, but we are not done yet. Uh, we'll be, uh, there's a lot to be said about uh, sports. There's a lot to be said about soccer. There's a lot to be said about social inclusion. And thus, we are going to continue our discussions also at uh, at, at, at dinner. I thought that the, 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 the meeting this morning was, uh, and this afternoon was already uh, 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 very interesting and uh, I, as somebody who doesn't usually study the history of sport, uh, le learned, learned a lot and I thought both the discussions on the role of race and racism in the history of sports and the, uh, the, uh, the discussions on, on, on gender very much spoke to one another. And they began kind of a conversation also on the global links of these, uh, these problems. We, uh, many of you study one particular region of the world, but, uh, but for, the, for the audience, it was clear how discussions in Brazil and the United States and Africa and elsewhere, how they actually speak to one another and how they add to our understanding of the problem of inclusion in terms of race, in terms of gender and sports. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that that's a very uh, promising continuation to the discussions that we have had previously in Cambridge two years ago and then in uh, Piraeus uh, last, last year. So now uh, it is my great honor to be able to introduce uh, David Cohn, who is perhaps the world's most knowledgeable, knowledgeable person <laughs> on soccer. <laughs> And he's certainly the world's best-known journalist covering the, uh, the, the, the covering the sport of soccer. David, as you know, uh, works for The Guardian, which is also one of the world's greatest newspapers. It's true. What can I say? It's true. And his reporting on soccer has... Uh, has garnered him multiple awards, including he was elected three times the United Kingdom's Sports Reporter of the Year. And then in 2013, he was also elected to be the Sports Journalist of the Year by the Br British Journalism Awards. Um, David is also the author, along with his many, many articles uh, published in The Guardian, he's also the author of four important books related to the history of soccer, which just testifies to the fact that you're the world's most knowledgeable person about soccer. <laughs> no one else <laughs> and, yeah, But maybe not four. Uh, and uh, he has written, uh, in 1997, he published The Football Business, then he published The Beautiful Game, Searching for the Soul of Football in 2004. And in 2012, he uh, published Richer Than God, which was him grappling with the more recent history of the team that you supported, uh, I guess, as a kid, Manchester City. And uh, recently, last year, he wrote an important book on the fall of the house of FIFA. I know we have a FIFA official here, so... Uh, you wait, you wait. Ah, OK, OK. Ooh, OK, sorry. OK, that, that, that show... This, this clearly shows that I'm not the world's leading expert in the history of soccer. So, David, welcome. I don't, know, I don't know what you can, what you can, what you can do after a build-up like that, and uh, walking into a room and being described as the world's top uh, something or other. I think we should just all go home now. Thank you very much. It's, it's all downhill from here. Uh, things can only get worse. Um, well, uh, obviously, I'll start with the same as everybody else to thank you very much for inviting me to come here, and it's uh, you know it is a privilege for you to to have asked me to come. Uh, I do think it's a very important subject uh, that you're talking about, which is essentially how sport, uh, football is obviously uh, always been my speciality and it's the, the, the interest and, um, of, of a lot of the people here and we've got clubs, top clubs here as well. Um, and so for you to ask me to come and talk, uh, you know, is, uh, is a privilege, so thank you very much. Um, I did a talk in Liverpool once, uh, it, was a, it was a Liverpool Literary Festival and I was on the panel 
And I was doing this, you know, saying what a privilege it is to be invited and Liverpool's such a special place to me, which is true. And, you know, it's so nice. And someone, someone in the audience said, stop sucking up to us and get on with it. <laughs> so, um, so what I'm going to do now is stop sucking up to you and get on with it. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit, and it's been very interesting, obviously, over the last couple of days, uh, hearing people talking, but also having a, a conversation with Olympiakos, uh, the people here, which was uh, very enlightening to me, actually. Um, and I think that sometimes we're very familiar with our own uh, sphere, you know, where we are. Uh, and I realised that actually some of the things that we're very familiar with in English football, in the Premier League, uh, aren't that well known to, to Olympiacos, certainly, and even in Europe, let alone in the US. And I actually think it's, it's been quite enlightening to me and changed my perspective a little bit. So I'm just going to take you through some of, uh, some of this. and. Uh, some of the history as well um, because actually I think that um, if we go into just that little bit of detail I know that it's at the dinner uh, there is that discipline of everybody wanting to get on with eating and I'm sure that I'll be apologizing like everybody else has been for going on for too long uh, but if I think a little bit of detail is actually going to be quite useful so just a little bit about my own background um, I grew up in Manchester, uh, yeah, and uh, we've talked about how sport, and I think it's been really important, how sport can be a force not for good things. We've heard today about how sport can be a vehicle for, well, Barcelona are doing anti-bullying through sport, and then we heard that actually sport can be one of the biggest vehicles for bullying. It can be a vehicle for racism, it can be a vehicle for tribalism, for violence, for division. So we like to think and have an idealised view that sport brings people together. But actually, it, it, I, I've thought so much about this. And I used to think, is sport a force for good? Is sport character building? When, I, when we're at school, the English tradition of teaching sport in school is it's character building. It's character building. And when we used to play in Manchester, it was incredibly rough playing in Manchester. And you would play teams that, you know, you, it was dangerous. And I, I used to think... Is it character building that these people are playing sport? So do they mean that if these people weren't playing sport, they would be even worse characters than they are now? Or actually, is the sport giving them a vehicle to be thugs, to be violent? Um, and uh, actually, the way that I resolve this question in my own mind is, sport can be both. It can be both. And so the importance of arguing and campaigning and behaving and for clubs to conduct themselves, and for people in sport to conduct themselves, for sport to be a force for good, uh, then, then that is uh, a challenge. And for me, as I'll explain, uh, that became a very central part of uh, the work that I was doing. So I grew up, and I would say that I had a very idealized love of sport. I loved playing sport. Sport was everywhere around in Manchester. It was in the air that we breathed. Uh, you decided which club you were going to support, City or United. Sometimes you decided it under threat of, uh, you know, uh, which one you were going to say. I chose the sky blue of City. Uh, my story, see, I just know I'm going to go on for too long now because I'm, like, I'm ten minutes in and I'm still about six years old. So uh, we, we've got to get on to working for The Guardian and writing books and being the world's foremost, whatever it was. But anyway, um, basically, it, I still think it's quite a nice story to tell you. So when I was a kid, was like my father, he did like football, but he'd stopped liking football by the time that, he, that we were growing up. So it wasn't like he supported City, so we supported. He, he, we, I didn't have anyone giving me a lead. At the time, Manchester United had, a, they're called the Red Devils, and they had a devil in the badge, right? And City had the ship and the red rose of Manchester, which they've gone back to now. So as a six-year-old boy, I opened the Manchester Evening News. My, brother, my older brother, which team are you going to support? And there was a devil. <laughs> and there was a ship and a red rose and the sky blue of Manchester City. So, and I always had a very idealised view of City all the way through, even growing up. So... so you know, going to university, and in fact, starting to work um, 
And people have obviously written in modern times about support, uh, what supporting a football club means to you uh, and how it becomes a badge of loyalty and it becomes about where you're from and your home and it has so many memories. And I definitely obviously was part of that. So uh, I was debating whether to tell you my guilty secret or not and I've decided that in the end I probably will. So I did not start working as a journalist. Uh, I actually qualified as a lawyer first. And that has always been a very guilty secret of mine. It's not something that you want to readily admit to, uh, you know, in public, as Nick will know. So, um, but anyway, it's kind of relevant. So uh, I qualified as a lawyer, for, but I did always want to be a writer. And um, in the early 1990s, I qualified as a lawyer. I was working in London and actually just gave it up, basically, to start writing. And I always say to young people, don't do it like that. So that's just a really silly overly risky way to, to do it. But anyway, I sort of decided that if I didn't do that, then I might end up not doing the job that I wanted to do. And so, and what happened was it stood me, being a lawyer and having that skill and having that discipline, I think, of analysis did stand me in good stead and it kind of led me onto the investigative route. And when I started working as a journalist, which I really never thought that writing about football would turn into this investigative journey into all of these issues, some of them very, very serious issues of sport. Because, as I say, I had an idealised view of football. I thought it would just be a lovely thing to write about football. It was the early 1990s, and that is when the big money was coming into English football. So I found myself, because of the background that I had, being asked by the first newspapers and magazines that managed to give me any work to look into this thing about the money coming into football. And actually, my sort of moment of big realisation that sent me on the whole journey was actually the t a takeover of my own club, Manchester City. We were taken over, and this again, I know that definitely now I'm going to go on for too long now. Um, we were taken over by a former playing hero of ours called Francis Lee. And he was someone I idolised when I was a kid, and so did all the fans of Manchester City. So when he took over our club from a chairman that we'd grown up hating, we thought, this is deliverance from the bad times, and he's going to bring the good times to Manchester City. And I, went, and I felt like that. I felt like that as a supporter. And then I went to interview Francis Lee. I, literally, I was cheering him on on the Saturday. And on the Monday, I, I was sat in his office. And he said, how long do you want? Five minutes. And uh, I said, no, I think I'm going to need a little bit longer than that. Anyway, the, the crux of the matter was that it became very clear to me that what, amongst maybe other motivations, the central motivation of this takeover was that Francis Lee and his associates were going to make money for themselves out of taking over my club. And to me, that just felt wrong. I still didn't understand about the structure of sport and the history of, uh, obviously I knew some history but, uh, about you know, the work that I then ended up doing. But I started with a gut feeling that that doesn't sound right, that he is looking to make money out of my football club. Because we don't think of it as something you make money out of, we think about it as, as a club and as something that you belong to and something that you love, not. And literally, I was you know, well into my 20s, I didn't know that the football clubs of England were companies. And most supporters didn't know that. And we didn't grow up hearing of people as owners. Now we hear about them as owners, some of them own two clubs now. Um, even more than that, some Americans own, own clubs in, uh, in England now. We never, we never talked about owners. And, um, and basically, that, from that gut feeling, and the other element of it, which started to feel wrong, was that they explained to me about the hundreds of millions of pounds that were coming into the game from pay television. That's what had come in in the early 1990s, and that was what the big money was from. The first deal with the Premier League, with Sky and the BBC, was 305 million over five years, which is now absolutely nothing, but at the time was huge money. So essentially, it sent me on a journey into investigating, like, this doesn't feel right. They, have, they are making hundreds of millions of pounds. They're making money for themselves out of taking over the clubs. But we're playing football a mile away from the ground 
and the playing fields of Manchester are in a terrible state. I don't know what it's like in America or even in Europe, but in England, in the UK, most of the sports facilities are publicly owned. They're owned by the local government. And they'd been through years of cuts, which now they're going through years of financial cuts again, and they were in a terrible, disgusting state. And we, I was playing with friends of mine. We formed our own football club. We were all working, we were all paying our taxes, and we were playing in this horrible, uh, environment with no changing rooms as I say quite dangerous in some ways I wrote about it I got it all off my chest 20 years ago so I shouldn't be going on about it with such venom again now uh, but it was literally two miles away from Old Trafford and at Old Trafford they were making hundreds of millions of pounds and the owner was making money anyway so that was what turned into my first book which was the football business and that exposed um, not exposed but told the story of this modern transformation of English football. And just to give you the bare bones of what happened, in, in 100 years before that, we had the Football League, and it was, well, just take it from me, otherwise we'll get into far too much detail about when did the third and fourth division join the other two. But basically, we had 100 years of, of four divisions, and the money was always shared within football. And when you had television money and sponsorship money, the first division clubs, which was Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool, they had, in the end, 50% of the money, even though they were the ones that were always on television. The second division clubs had 25% of the money, and the third and fourth division clubs had 25% between them. And the money was shared throughout. And clubs like Nottingham Forest could... The, the, the financial gap between the top and the other three divisions wasn't so great. And we had a much bigger variety of clubs that could win the league or could be in the first division. And that's how a small club, if you've got a genius of a manager and a set of circumstances, could rise up like a miracle and, and w even win the European Cup. Uh, what happened was the big clubs wanted more of the money. They knew that the satellite, uh, that 1992 was a new television deal and now we have pay television. So in preparation for that happening, they engineered a breakaway from the sharing of the money. So the Premier League is a breakaway of the first division from the Football League, from sharing. And I wrote about this so many times, and I still do, that I ended up you know, with this way of just being able to just describe it, which is something like, so the first division clubs broke away from the Football League in order not to have to share the new money with the rest of the, with the other 72 clubs. So I wrote about that in the football business and then obviously what happened was uh, the clubs are companies. They got huge money into the Premier League. Suddenly these clubs are valuable companies with big money coming in for the first time in their histories and the owners at that time, it was floating on the stock market to try and make money out of it. And most supporters, many English football club supporters, didn't really understand you know, all of this. And I honestly didn't know what stock market flotation, how it made you money. And I literally called a friend of mine who was an accountant, and he had a, a colleague of his sit me down in the office and explain how floating on the stock market makes money for you as a shareholder and I wrote about that in my book as if I was the world's <laughs> foremost expert in uh, stock market flotations and I had a table I had a table called football's fat cats of how much money their shares cost them which was like a hundred thousand pounds and how much money they were worth then which was like 20 million pounds and um, and the encouraging aspect of this was that at the time, and I know the Premier League is, is a great success, and nobody's saying that, that it isn't, and that they haven't run themselves and run the clubs very, very well. But at the time, you know, it wasn't just me that was objecting to this, and there was a big movement of supporters, and there is an active, supporters are active in England, in the UK, I know they are elsewhere as well, and they were reacting against these changes. So ticket prices were suddenly being increased. And it was so affordable for us. So when we were growing up, we went with our parents if we could get our parents to take us, which not all of us could. But anyway, we went as children. And then when we had to pay full price, the full price was literally one pound 
or two pounds and we just all went and when you see um, when you remember it it was all young people going to the match not all the young people behaved themselves and that was that was part of it and some people think that the ticket prices were increased on purpose by the clubs to try to price out the hooligans but they've priced out a generation of young people and it was a very huge formative experience for us to be part of something so big in your own neighbourhood that you could go to that was a national and international thing, football, to stand on the terraces and it's formative to I'm sure many people in this room and uh, you know I mean to our generation it was one of the biggest formative experiences for our generation and ticket prices were rising and that was something that people were uh, agitating and very much opposing and still do and all of these other issues. So the Labour government at the time formed what was called the Football Task Force and they were looking into these issues of commercialisation and uh, the administrator of the Football Task Force uh, was somebody who then, he had a, he, he is still a politician and he had a very good political career afterwards called Andy Burnham and he was a very genuine guy and he actually read my book The Football Business and he said, I, I accept your, uh, you know, I accept that analysis and we want to do something about that. To cut a long story short, because, you know, uh, it's a dinner and we want to eat at some point, um, they produced a report and they managed to get the clubs to agree. And part of the reason that the clubs agreed was because the European Commission, by then, was attacking the Premier League for collective selling of TV rights. So they were saying, you are acting as a monopoly, as a cartel, by 20 of you gathering together to sell your TV rights. It's anti-competitive. And obviously no one in football but agrees with that. Everyone agrees that a league should sell rights. But it was a very serious threat. And the government, uh, they wanted government support. So at that time, the government said they had a deal with them. The government was not going to pass a law to make football more equal and to redistribute the money and to do anything about ticket prices. They were not going to bring in a law. So little Andy Burnham and his first political job after Labour got elected with some round glasses and I think he read my book because he was canvassing for the Labour Party and someone punched him on the nose and he broke his nose and he was in hospital and someone bought him my book to read while he was in hospital and that's how it ended up happening. And uh, anyway, he, he phoned me and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get something here. And what they did, and I've, I actually dug out this report, which is 19 years old now, and I had it in a box somewhere, and I was coming here, and I thought, I'm going to find I'm going to find that. Is it in the shed? Is it in the, which box is it in? And I found it, investing in the community. And what he got them to agree to was that the government would support collective selling. And in return, the Premier League would, and I'm going to actually read it, because it's, the actual words are really important. The, uh, the specific word that was used. The Premier League the Premier League should continue to make a minimum of 5% of income available post-2001 primarily for investment in grassroots facilities and projects. 5% of income the Premier League was going to give, right? And Andy Burnham, I remember him calling me and telling me I'm going to get them to agree to 5% of income and I said 5%! They were giving 50%. They're broken away from 50% of sharing. And you're coming boasting to me that you're going to get 5% for them. Um, and um, anyway, now it's not just Andy Burnham that boasts about the 5%. Now the Premier League boasts about the, five, about the money they give. Right. And, but this is what's been so interesting to me here, is that... The Premier League does give money to grassroots facilities and to community projects. Every Premier League club has a, a big community project. We don't really call them foundations mostly. I think Manchester United is called a foundation. They have community programmes. Um, the total that the Premier League gives now is £100 million a year. They also give money to the Football League, what's now called the EFL, because they think that they thought that in America, they want to break foot soccer in America, obviously, and they think in America you only understand competitions that have three letters, NBA, MLB, uh, uh, NFL. And they're like, why isn't the Football League big in America? And then they, they said, we're having a great rebranding, we're calling it the EFL. Anyway, this is why we hate 
the Premier League being called the EPL because we just think that's just Americans. They can't. <laughs> The Americans can't actually take in Premier League, like that many letters. Anyway, um, anyway, um, so where was I? So the Premier League also give money to the EFL for community projects, and they really do, and they do give them, they give, also give them money just to the clubs uh, for what they call solidarity, which I find a cynical word. When they're broken away from 50% of sharing, they give a bit of money and they call it solidarity. Now, I'm really used to criticising the Premier League for not giving enough and because they have not kept to this pledge of 5% of income. And what it became, and to be fair to them, there was a minister afterwards and he tried to get more out of them and he made a mistake because, it, because he asked for like 6% or 10% above a certain level, but he only asked for it out of the TV rights for the UK the domestic TV rights. Mm. So they've always taken it since, the Premier League's always taken it since then that it's 5% of the domestic TV rights that we, that we distribute from, right? Um, and in the, at the same time, the international rights have gone in enormous, and the international rights are now three billion pounds over three years, but that, that doesn't count. We keep to 5% of domestic rights, and we don't keep to 5% of income. That's, that was superseded. That's finished now. So that's why I like to dig this out of the shed, and I like to go back to that and say, I thought it should be a lot more than 5%, but at least if you said 5% of income, stick to that. And if you Google my name and 3.6%, you'll find that I've written a lot, that all they're giving is 3.6% of their TV deals, and their current... Their, their income last year was 4.4 billion and so the 100 million is 2.6% of income, 2.6%. So that means that 97.4% they're keeping or they're giving some to the Football League but they're keeping 97.4% to do what they want with but we hear a lot about the 2.6% about the work they do, about the, the redistribution, about how no other league does that and how good they are and how great the work is. Now, when they started doing this work, you can imagine, like for me, starting out as a journalist, the government has actually read my book, the government has got to deal with the Premier League and the government is doing some of the work which I've been pleading that they should do. So, in some ways, of course, you know, I'm not just pleased about it, I'm quite emotional about it, that this work is going on and I had some part to play in in it, in it happening, but, and maybe I'm being unfair to them, but when I started to feel that this is being done for their own image or for relations with the government, to say to the government, look at the good work we do, you should never regulate us, you should, you know, you should uh, see us as a national asset, which obviously they are, and as I say, I may be being unfair because so many people working in the community programmes are really genuine people. And the work that they're doing is fantastic work, a lot of it. And I did do a lot of reporting on it at first and thought, this is what f football clubs are supposed to be about. Of course they're about what we see of the great players, of winning, of competing. The, but that attraction and that appeal... Uh, that, that they have, that should be used for, to do good. And actually, the, the core purpose of the clubs themselves should be to be a force for good in the world, to promote participation, to promote all the, the good values uh, that, we've, that we've heard about and that other people have been talking about. Uh, and so, as I say, I may be being unfair but I've stopped really praising it and I end up being a little bit critical about that it's not enough and that maybe... Um, and, and the thing is, so many of the clubs are in the original poor areas that they were in. Like Liverpool is one of the poorest areas in the whole of the UK, in the whole of Europe. There's terrible social problems in Liverpool which have improved a little bit. And so the, the club itself is doing more under the owners, under the Boston owners, there's a lot of enlightenment and they're doing a lot more in the community and they're, they, 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 they're supporting breakfast clubs because there's so many kids right in that neighbourhood that don't eat, 
don't eat breakfast, they don't have enough to eat generally. Um, but at the same time, what we're seeing there is then that modern football is a huge illustration of inequality because they are doing that work and that is to be applauded but at the same time they're owned by billionaires the players are multi-millionaires and they're good people you know I'm not criticizing the players but next door to that institution is real poverty that shouldn't be there in the modern world and that's a huge challenge and is the 5% or the 2% or the 0.7% or having a foundation that does a bit of work, is that really enough to address what power football and sport could be playing, has got, and the role that it could be playing uh, in the modern world? But what's been so kind of enlightening for me is that coming from that perspective, but then speaking to Olympiakos and hearing that actually uh, you're doing a lot of really important work and you did incredible work with the refugees uh, when they arrived in Athens, but what you were telling me was that it's, you're on your own really in Greece in terms of football clubs doing this work and also there aren't enough links with other clubs in Europe to, to share this kind of work, to share this information. That's why I asked you, Maria, that question today about the figures, 0.7% of this huge uh, income value that a great club like Barcelona has now, but also whether La Liga and the Federation are promoting it, which they're not really. And then UEFA, it's difficult for UEFA to be a central force for this work, which is the European Federation, because you know they rely on the clubs, and the clubs are in this, these diverse, different situations. Uh, and the clubs also have their own lobbying association called the European Club Association, which is mainly for the big clubs. And so it's made me realise that I'm in a strange position of thinking, if only they all gave 5% of their domestic TV rights to community work, wouldn't it be so much better? And realising that the Premier League is actually, because of what happened, because they needed the government, because there was a lot of criticism, and because they did this deal, actually they're doing more than just about any other European league, certainly, and that most of the other European clubs. And so... Again, this is a very strange time to be arguing that what we really need is for the UK to cooperate more with Europe. You know, uh, we've kind of lost that argument really badly uh, and we're in a complete crisis of our own from losing that argument. But um, if, you know, if something really good can come out of the discussions that you're having and the initiatives that are taking place and the people that are here, uh, is to say that uh, if more of this work can be done if the big sports clubs, the big games can see themselves not just as more than a club but as more than a business, as more than a part of entertainment, as more than just sports, sport content for, uh, for the media and if they can see their core role as being to, to be there, to be the people's game to be the people's sport and to be and that everything that happens the gla the glamour of the club is in the service of the good that the club is supposed to be there for and if there can be more agreement of that and more cooperation of that in Europe obviously which is our where we're from but I mean America sport is huge and if there can be more cooperation on that then I think that that would be that's where I'd love to see things heading so, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for describing me as the world's foremost, whatever it was. And please enjoy your dinner. Thank you very much. David, that was... Um, thank you so much. Um, that was... As we say, we, we, we love that the English, you use that term massive so much. <laughs> because, I mean, you're supposed to be such a, a sort of understated people, but this sort of massive, massive, massive... <laughs> But thank you. That was really great. And, you know, thank you for coming and thank you for participating in this. And, you know, I mean, I think your presence has just added more to, you know, what is a really fantastic conference. Thank you again. Yeah, do people want to, you know, people want to, you're going to be put on the hot spot now. You get to ask the, now. Well, I've got one for you. Come on up. So I know this, the answer to this, but I'm going to put it to you. Well, that's unfair. So what do you think of Sergio Ramos? Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> OK, OK. How long have we got? How long have we got? Yeah. 
How long have we got? All, all I need to say is that when we arrived, when I arrived in Boston, when I landed in Boston, I was still talking about Sergio Ramos. And who is the first person that we meet after Steve Ortega with, and thank you for all your hospitality while we've been here, it's been fantastic, he picked us up at the airport. So the first person that we meet after that is a world-class centre-back, Lillian Turam. So we say to Lillian, so, so I mean, all we're talking about is Sergio Ramos, and we say to Lillian, you know, like because the coverage in England was that that was good defending. And we have ex-professional stars doing the coverage. We have Gary Lineker presenting it. We have Rio Ferdinand. I think Steven Gerrard was even on that uh, panel and Frank Lampard. And they all said, no, no, Ramos didn't mean it. And it was good defending. And Lillian said, Ramos knew exactly what he was doing. He, he knows it's dangerous to have him like that. Any defender knows it's dangerous to pull him over like that and it can be dangerous for his shoulder. So I don't need to go on about Sergio Ramos anymore. Someone who knows a lot more about it said that that was... And you can't find a word for it because people said it was cynical. But I don't really know what cynical means in that context. And the worst one, Christian, the worst one is when they say it was professional. It was professional. Because is that professional? And I know because of, the, you know, I know Liverpool really, really well and I won't talk about all, you know, but the history of Liverpool and what it meant to those supporters to be there, what that journey to the final meant. And also it was difficult for them to get to Kiev and it was very expensive. And to see Ramos just, for me, take out the one danger to them because they want to win their third Champions League in, the, in a row. Win it. Go and win it then. That's professional. Go and win it. But go and win it fairly within the rules. And then we've seen that the goalkeeper, the poor goalkeeper... Like, Rio Ferdinand was saying that the goalkeeper will have problems for life from making those mistakes in that moment. He will struggle mentally to overcome having done that in that environment. And then we saw that Ramos had elbowed him two minutes before he did it. It's ruthless, even ruthless isn't the word. So anyway, we have a saying, don't get me started. <laughs> I knew I could find the that one. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask any questions? So, if you look at the, the in perspective of a football soccer compared to other sports, NFL, NBA, MLB, PGA, I forgot about PGA. I never know what the hockey one is. Is it NHL? Yeah. They're all three letters, I know. MLS. MLS. Yeah. How does that compare in terms of sharing the community and giving back to the community, given the other one make as much money, if not more? In the US. In the US. Yeah. I've, ne I've never done a, a comparison and I don't actually know. I don't know that much about US sport, but one part of it, which if you hadn't brought me up here again uh, to answer questions, but one part that I missed out was in my investigations, if you like, at the beginning to, um, to the commercialization of football. A really important discovery for me was the origins of the clubs themselves in England. And um, they were started as social enterprises. So they were started in the late Victorian period in England, which has been obviously written about by Charles Dickens and you know, many, many other people about the terrible conditions that people lived in, the Industrial Revolution, the coal mines, the factories, the no health and safety, the terrible sanitation and all the rest of it. And in those cities, football particularly, but sport, was introduced by enlightened employers. So Manchester United, they were workers on the railway. West Ham were workers, uh, it, was, it was an iron works. Arsenal, Arsenal were the gunners. It was a, an artillery, uh, an ammunition factory, the Woolwich Arsenal. 
But many of the clubs, including Manchester City, I, mean, I was totally unaware of this when I was growing up, so it's not like why I started supporting them at all, nothing like that. Uh, we, we, most people have grown up quite ignorant of the history, and it was amazing really to discover it, that Manchester City, along with a lot of other clubs, were f started by churches. And so the church was in these neighbourhoods and they, was, they could see all these social problems. And this game arrived from basically the upper classes. And they formed football clubs. And it's documented to try to give people something more constructive to do. And in these... Was that character forming? It was character building. <laughs> and, in these, and in these... Yeah, because the guys then took it in their own way. But, um, but in these community programmes now where you're trying to you know, fight substance dependency, criminal, criminal offending and all the rest of it. It was, that was the basic purpose of the clubs right from the beginning, right? Now, so I'm not religious myself and I'm not also saying that, you know, uh, it was wrong for them to then become professional and become these great clubs. That's an amazing history in itself. But what was so satisfying for me was that it shows that your gut instinct that that doesn't feel right, that someone's bought this, my club now, and he wants to make multi-millions out. That doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel like what it's for. When you study the history, you realise, yeah, that isn't right. That isn't what it's for. And so that's why I'm trying to say that in whatever way, however it's done practically, the core purpose of the clubs and of the sports should be to do this good in society. But that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be great clubs with great players having these great competitions. It means that that should be in the service of, of something even greater than that. But what the NFL does, I don't know. You'll have to, you'll have to look on the website. Oh, that would be a big book for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sebastian? Uh, so, so I have a question. It's a little bit far afield from uh, the conference, but I feel like I would be remiss to ask, how do you feel about the England's chances in the <laughs> yeah, somebody else asked me that. Well, you know what's interesting is that this time there's no expectations whatsoever. So they've actually got quite a good young team that all play with top players, you know, that play with Brazilians now and against Brazilians and, you know, Spanish and, you know, and, and they're not over in French and they're not, sorry, sorry, <laughs> and, and Greeks and, uh, yeah, and, uh, and Americans, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, and so you know we should be feeling quite chipper about it. And normally we can have a terrible team, and we really th and not we, but generally people think we're going to win it, we're going to win the World Cup, you know. And then we're really shocked when we get knocked out by Iceland, and it's a national <laughs> disgrace. <laughs> But this time there's no expectation, so that, that could be quite dangerous. Anyone? Actually, let, let you eat your dinner. Okay. Thanks for all your interest. Thanks for asking the question.